Ice Stories Live. Thank you, Becky. What a story. I think there's only one thing I can say. Becky Murray, this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> what a story. That, now, you've told us lots of things, but one thing that really stood out for me was when you told the story of the nine-year-old in Kenya, when, if she was told she couldn't do something, but she can and she will. Does that remind you of anybody? Oh, no, help me out here, George. <laughs> well, it's it, it sort of reminded me of you, of your determination. <laughs> See? <laughs> when you started I'll as a... I'll take that. That's a compliment. I'll take that. <laughs> in the sense, when you, when you were speaking with her, did you see a little bit of yourself in her when you were with her? I, I don't know. I've never thought of that, to be brutally honest. I don't know. I've, I guess I've just been so proud of her mm -hmm. because she had so many voices that told her she couldn't and told mm -hmm. her no or... You know, she was so shunned by not only her own remaining family members, but then the village itself. And so to see her come into an environment where she was loved and she was celebrated, mm -hmm. to then watch her thrive, I've just been incredibly proud of her, really, and just honoured to be able to even just be a, a small part of her journey mm -hmm. and watch God just bring her alive. Well, you've had a fantastic journey, of course, with God. It began at a very early age. Um, you said at four years old... You wanted to be a missionary. What brought those thoughts up at that age? I, I literally have no idea. That's why I genuinely relate it to the scripture about God molding in, his, in our mother's womb, because mm -hmm. I don't think that could have been anything of myself. It, it wasn't something I'd been around. None of mm -hmm. my family come from a missionary type background. So it wasn't something I'd been exposed to. It, it wasn't something that, that a three or four year old can just conjure up. So I genuinely believe it was right there. It was God that had already birthed something within me right back from the moment of him shaping me in my mum's womb. Um, so, yeah. So, of course, you waited a long time for it to happen. So why, did, why do you think then that God actually called you or shaped you to do this work? I believe he calls everyone. I think, um, obviously, it's not, not just myself. I think there's plans and purposes for every single life, uh, mm -hmm. that God's got a plan and a purpose for everyone. And I think the scary revelation is realizing sometimes the only thing stood between us and the destiny is ourselves. It's, mm -hmm. it's our willingness to say yes to God. And sometimes different things can hold us back. I know... I know, for example, so I'll give you this as an example because I've been speaking tonight. But I remember a few years ago um, when I was first asked to publicly speak and I said, oh, no, 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 no. See, I, I'm happier behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Get me in the outbacks of Africa and I'm as happy as anything. Put a microphone in my hand, no way, no how. And for years I said no to that because I felt like, well, that's somebody else's gift and I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to be in the outbacks of Kenya, thanks. Um, but sometimes we, we say no in certain areas because we think there's always somebody else better equipped. There's always mm. better speakers than us or there's always better CEOs than us or there's always better founders than us. There's always someone that we think, well, they could do the job better. And so we hold back. But sometimes if we would stop with all the excuses as to why we could not and should not and just say yes to God. You know, Isaiah, the prophet says, here I am, send me. Mm -hmm. And at the moment when he says that, he has no idea what he's signing up for. Like God has not laid out what the plan was mm -hmm. at that moment. He just said that his eyes were searching for who will go for us, who can I send? And Isaiah throws himself in with this abandonment of, here I am, send me, I'm all in. And he has no idea what he's signing himself up for, but he's all in. And I love that kind of mentality where, Sometimes God's asked us to do stuff and we've not had the finances for it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily at that moment had the influence or the open door to necessarily do it. But as we've stepped out, God steps in. And sometimes just the stepping out is really hard when you can't see, naturally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time we step out, it enables God to step in. I like the expression you used, actually. Um, say yes first. How difficult is it to say yes first? It is. I think when, when you look at the problem or you look at the challenge, saying mm -hmm. yes can feel really daunting. Um, and even like, so even last year when I got the phone call about the three-year-old, mm -hmm. and immediately I knew 
you know when you just know the Holy Spirit is prompting you. And I knew, but I remember putting the phone down saying, not now, God, not now, God, because carrying one by one through the global pandemic has been really hard. We've got 80 staff. We've got hundreds of kids, all of whom we're responsible for, for, fee- for whether it be paying their wages or whether it's feeding and housing and educating. And I remember coming through COVID, making my mind up, I made this little master plan that I'm not mm-hmm. going to take on any new kids. I'm not going to take <laughs> on any new staff. I'm not going to start any new projects because I wanted to be responsible with the staff and kids already in my care. And with the pandemic, we'd had so many people who had maybe supported one by one for years having to pull out because of the pandemic. And so I'm seeing people pulling out and yet the bills are only ever getting bigger. And then all of a sudden I get that phone call about the three year old. And I had a choice in that moment mm-hmm. to say yes or to say no. And the temptation, I'm going to be really honest, the temptation was to say no because practically it didn't make sense. In a season where funds are going down, it mm-hmm. doesn't make sense to expand. Um, logic would say, you know, batten down the hatches and just be wise and responsible. But when you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that's when everything shifts. You know, when you feel God's in this, that's when you have to say yes, because he's the one who's going to bring in the finances. He's the one who's capable of doing it all anyway. Uh, But it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's easy. But when our eyes are fixed on him, as opposed Mm -hmm. to the challenge ahead of us, it's easier to say yes. It's not easy. It's easier (laughs) to say yes. Well, your first encounter, of course, with Jesus began at nine years of age, you said. Mm -hmm. And you were filled with the Holy Spirit at the age of 14. For people who are listening who don't know anything about that, what exactly is that being filled with the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit, um, I believe, is part of the Trinity. So you've got God the Father, God the Mm. Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit is here on the earth right now. So Mm -hmm. when Jesus went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came to the earth. And as followers of Jesus, um, what the Holy Spirit is, it's a gift of God when we ask for him to come and fill us. Mm-hmm. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit. So I began to speak in other tongues and, and move in prophecy and different kinds of things. But that happened at the age of 14. And how did that help you uh, as a Christian? It gave me a boldness mm-hmm. that I didn't know before. I um, you, you might not believe this, but I'm actually quite a timid person. Oh, yeah. So if, if I, <laughs> no, genuinely, genuinely. <laughs> nobody ever, because, because I now speak publicly, no one believes me. But if I walk into a room, I I, I want to find the corner. I, I want to find the, the spot where I can hide or just fade into the background. And my husband is the extrovert. My husband's the one who's just where the party's at. You know, wherever okay. Matthew is, there's the party. <laughs> he's got the gift of the gab, as we say, and he's larger than life. Whereas I'm quite, quite quiet and quite timid naturally. Um, but when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I had this boldness and i believe i believe it's that rather than a natural boldness because it comes on me in Mm. certain times and for certain purposes so for example standing up to a brick master even though that can risk your own life a boldness will come in those seasons whereas walking into a i don't know a dinner party or something i'll go and hide in the corner (laughs) Excellent. Now, you said, of course, you had your dream, and you, um, and I think it was 18 years of age, you said you were, you heard the voice of God say you would run a children's home, but yeah. you waited a long time for it. Was there ever a point in that waiting that you think it's not going to happen? Oh, every day. Every <laughs> day. I, I genuinely thought it would happen this month, this year. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's just a typical teenager that you just think, <laughs> you know, you've got your own timeline and it's now. <laughs>
And um, I was very much like that. And so when year after year was passing by and nothing would happen, like that's when the voice of the enemy can creep in of, did God say? You know, mm-hmm. Satan came to Eve in the garden and said, did God say? And he's not changed his tactics. He's still mm-hmm. coming up with the same lines even today. And he would often say to me, did God say, did you make it all up? Was it something in your head? And I knew that I knew that it was God. I had no doubt about it. But when year after year was passing and nothing was happening, it was incredibly frustrating at the Mm -hmm. time. And I think now I look back, I see the wisdom of God in terms of God will often give us one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that is one, it creates a dependency on him. Mm -hmm. that we are literally dependent on him for our next step. So if you say to me, okay, you know, what's your next 10 year strategy? It's waiting on God. Um, (laughs) And we have got certain nations on our hearts that we are wanting to expand our anti-slavery work in, but we're very much led by, by God on what we, what we're doing. But then the second thing, the second reason why I believe he gives us a step at a time is because otherwise, if God had said to me back on, right back when I was 18, all he said to me was a children's home. That's all he said. He didn't say anything else back when I was 18. I think if God at that point had told me a home and a school and a church and a medical center and all this, that and the other in Kenya, and then the global dignity project impacting many different nations and then anti-slavery work in Pakistan and then all the other stuff we're doing, if he'd have said that when I was 18, I would have either retreated and said no way that's way too much too big too hard ask someone else or i would have tried to run ahead of god to try Mm -hmm. and make it happen but instead in god's wisdom all he said to me when i was 18 was a children's home he didn't even tell me the where at that point and so just holding on to his promise and letting it fulfill in his way um was probably the best thing i ever did so would you recommend waiting i do I do. I think that's the funny thing with God, though, because sometimes he'll ask you and it's this immediate response that he, mm-hmm. he, he demands from you. Like I think of the when the disciples went fishing um, on Jesus had been crucified. The disciples were out fishing, fishing all night and they catch literally nothing. Mm-hmm. And then a voice from the shore comes and they don't realize it's Jesus at this moment. But the voice from the shore comes and says, cast your net to the right. And immediately they respond and because Mm -hmm. they immediately respond in obedience they catch 153 fish Mm -hmm. and so the beauty of of god is he doesn't do things the same way every time Um, and so sometimes he will ask you and he's waiting for this immediate yes just like the prophet isaiah i'm all in Mm -hmm. you know pick me i'm here pick me choose me god (laughs) and throw that net to the right this immediate response but other times he will give you a promise and then he'll wait for it to just mature within you and he'll start nurturing you and the character within you so that you're able to withstand the gift or the calling that he's got for your life. Of course, all this thing, uh, work and everything that God has given you uh, creates a great responsibility of the people you have working for you and with the children. Yeah. How do you feel uh, being responsible for so many people? When I think of it that way, I get a bit scared, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is uh, it is a big responsibility, and I, I, I take it very seriously. Mm-hmm. Particularly, so some of my staff in certain areas of Pakistan quite literally put their lives on the line to do mm-hmm. the type of work we do. To do Sunday school in Pakistan, that in and of itself is a miracle. But it's not happening in some nice little neat church building. This is happening on the brick factory floor. Mm-hmm. And sometimes our teams have gone in and they've literally been chased away. Um, it's it's not always favorable, shall we mm-hmm. say. I remember one brick factory that myself and my husband, Matthew, went into just two weeks before two, two Christians had been skinned alive. And so wow. we don't play at this. We take this incredibly seriously. Um, so we do feel the weight of a responsibility But equally, the balance of that is knowing that one by one isn't mine. I'm just stewarding God's what God's got. And so with that, it it eases some of the tension or some of the responsibility in terms of as long as I remain obedient to God and as long as I remain faithful to what Mm -hmm. he's asking me to do day in, day out, 
then he'll carry what I'm not capable of carrying. Now, there was a, a massive, um, shall we say, incident in your life when your husband, when you were in America, and uh, your husband was taken down with malaria. Yeah. And you nearly lost him, but then again, as I said, nearly, ne nearly never killed a man. <laughs> but how did you win the battle between faith and fate? Mm. How did you win that battle? So there was this really interesting moment while he was in the ICU, and it's going to sound unrelated, so stay with me here, George. Okay. <laughs> but um, I was driving to the hospital this one day and suddenly realised that the gaslight had been flashing at me since the day before. I'm the type of person I never carry cash, you know. At the joy of being married is my husband pays for everything. It's great. Love I it. know, I know the feeling. <laughs> Best part of being married, right? Um, except it is my husband in the ICU. And so I'm driving to the hospital. Suddenly I'm at this traffic light and I suddenly notice the fuel light, which I remembered seeing yesterday. I have no money with me whatsoever. And it's such an insignificant problem by comparison of my husband's dying, his heart, his lungs, his liver, his kidneys are all in organ failure and his blood is overtaken with a parasite. In comparison to that, me running out of gas and being stranded is, is you know, it's, not an yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. But at, the, at that moment, it was the straw that broke this camel's back. And so I remember being sat, sat at this traffic light and just having a total meltdown. It was it was a case of God. I cannot take one more thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I made it to the hospital, but knew that I just by that point the tank was so empty that I wouldn't have enough to get me back home that night. But I just thought, well, I, I just have to face that later on. I walked into the hospital, and before being allowed into the ICU, you had to go into this little waiting area, and you had to call for permission to go into the ICU just in case they're like resuscitating your partner or something like that as you walk in. So I go into this waiting area and um, I speak to the receptionist, can I go and see my, 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 Matthew Murray, my name's Becky Murray. And so she's calling through. While she's on the phone calling through to get me permission to go in, this total stranger comes up to me. Now she's in this same waiting room. So mm -hmm. she herself must be going through a difficult situation because only the nearest and dearest were allowed on the ICU. Yep. And so this lady who I'd never met in my life comes up to me and she said, I have no idea why, but I just feel I have to give you this. And she put $50 in my hand and wow. that $50 filled my tank that day. Wow. And as she put the $50 in my hand, I just sensed the Holy Spirit whisper, I've got this, I've got this. And I knew in my heart that if God had got the capability to fill my tank with fuel, then how much more so could he look after the big problem, which was healing my husband on his deathbed? And sure enough, he did. That $50 carried me through some incredibly dark nights and still does today. I, I still go back in my mind to that $50 moment so many times because if God's got the small stuff, God's involved in the detail and the small stuff of our life as much as he is in the big, massive moments of our life. I was going to ask you to tell us a little bit about Matthew, uh, your husband, of course, who runs for fun. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> tell us a little bit how you met Matthew and uh, how you came to be together in this work. So uh, Matthew um, became a Christian at the church that I was already attending. And it was actually through doing the missions trips because um, I didn't really have much to do with Matthew. Matthew was a journalist when I first met him. Yeah. And... Um, I misinterpreted him. Matt's quite a confident person, mm -hmm. um, but I inter I'm, I'm just being really honest now, but I misinterpreted that and thought he was arrogant. Oh. So, so I avoided <laughs> him like the play because I don't like arrogance is one, like it's like the red rag to a bull. Like I mm -hmm. hate arrogance. And so I avoided him because I thought quite wrongly now that I know him, I thought he was arrogant. Well, we were out on a missions trip and on the first night, we'd all paired up. We were having prayer partners to go and pray for the sick. And I paired up with this girl and we were praying for the sick. But we quickly discovered on the first night that we needed to do male and female prayer partners just to protect um, ourselves because, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we just wanted to protect ourselves. So on the second night, all the teams seemed to pair up really quickly 
cost me being the timid one in the corner, hadn't picked my prayer partner. I was too late to the party, wasn't I? So the only person left was Matthew. Matthew. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't even like the guy. And I've got to go pray with him. I mean, that's hardly a very Christ-like attitude, is it? Um, but anyway, so I got paired up with him to go pray. And genuinely, my first thought that was positive about Matthew was somebody got healed. And I remember thinking, well, it can't be that bad then because God's just used him. Mm -hmm. And um, sure enough, my barriers started to come down and we became friends. Okay. Um, but as always happens, as the years go by, that friendship quickly turned into love. And we've been married, it could be 14 years this year. Excellent. You do know this is recording. You probably watch it later on. I know. I'll be in trouble for sharing that with you. Sharing too much, Becky. <laughs> now, I have to confess, okay? I have to confess. I have to see that ladies are good at multitasking. do you find time to be a mother a wife run all the organizations you have in uh, all around the world i mean where do you find the time there's only 24 hours in a day there is that's the joy of team so the reality is and the beauty of church is we need one another if mm -hmm. one by one depended solely on becky murray it would be in a very sorry state let me tell you um but the joy of working with 80 staff around the world. The staff that I work alongside are my heroes because they are as much sold out for the work One by One does as I am and I'm the founder, but they are as sold out. And the joy of working with these people means we can accomplish far more together in unity mm -hmm. following God than me by myself. And it's the beauty of church where sometimes we get confused and we think it's about, you know, these one-off heroes. And we look at the likes of Peter, for example, the Apostle Peter and or the Apostle Paul and these incredible heroes in scripture. And you're like, wow. But actually, they were never alone. You know, they had Dr. Luke with them or, mm -hmm. you know, I think of the, the healing at the Gate Beautiful and it was Peter and it was John. And Peter and John couldn't have been more opposite characters. You know, Peter's mm -hmm. known for his boldness and... He kind of puts his foot in it a lot because he speaks before I think sometimes. I can totally relate with that one. But Peter's known for his boldness. Well, John, on the other hand, was known for love and compassion. But when both of them together prayed for the man at the gate, beautiful, that lame man walked. And maybe it was the courage of Peter to step out and then the compassion of John to then go and lay hands on him. Maybe yeah. it was their giftings combined that brought forth that healing rather than it being about one person. And so the only reason one by one can do all that it's doing is A, the goodness of God, but B, working with some incredible people that have come alongside us. And not just staff, loads of volunteers mm -hmm. around the world who have said, you know, I want to get involved with one by one. How can, how can I be a part of this? And together we've mm -hmm. seen God do some incredible things. Well, you're doing uh, quite a successful uh, um, the ministry, but... Um... With all this work and everything all around the world, has there ever, ever been a time where you came and said, oh, I've had enough of this. I, I can't really go on anymore. I can't do it anymore. Have you ever reached that point? Yeah. Yes, I have. And what I, do you do at that time? I think 
I think, um, so I went through a, a painful season not long ago and I made one decision in the moment of an intense pain and that was don't make any decisions mm -hmm. because no one makes uh, wise decisions in the middle of their pain. And so I determined to go low and go mm -hmm. slow. And as I just sought God in the middle of a painful season, sought God, what do you want to do in this season? What are you doing in me in this season? Mm -hmm. Um, and just went low, uh, just focused in Jesus, shutting all the doors, shutting all the voices and just seeking God in his heart. And then go slow, not making any rash decisions, uh, not making any long term decisions in the middle of a short term pain as well. Just going low and going slow. And God gracefully and mercifully carried me through some incredibly dark nights. And I think the joy of walking with God is we have our history. You know, I think of the, the children of Israel, Israel, they're constantly told to remember the works of the Lord, mm -hmm. remember what God's done. And so that's why they got, you know, the, they chronicled the whole journey of the children of Israel because they wanted the next generation to know what God's done in the last generation. And it's the same in our own lives where when we remember what God has done, the seasons where he's brought you through the dark nights, that equips you for the next dark nights. And the dark nights come. You know, we don't go from mountaintop to mountaintop. There's plenty of valleys through our lives. But I've come to realize the water runs through the valleys. That's where the water flows. It's right there through the valleys. Amen. God has done far more in me in my valley seasons than he ever has done on my mountaintop seasons. Now, you mentioned, of course, that all the ministers that you have and uh, the early staff, and as you know, prices are going up, everything's going up all over the place. How do you fund the ministries? And if anybody wanted to contribute, how would they, um, you know, contribute? Yeah, you. it's it's all through uh, volunteers, through uh, different people who have heard about One by One and feel on their heart they want to become a part of it with us and they can't necessarily get on a plane and come with us to Pakistan, mm -hmm. but they can support us. And so it's through incredible people who have come alongside us, believe in the call of God and, and said, you know what, I want in, I, I want to help see the giant of modern day slavery come down. Um, modern day slavery is a, it's a human problem. You know, mm -hmm. we started it and humans started the problem. But the joy is together, as we work together, we can also see it come down. And um, so people can come alongside one by one. They can be a part of it in prayer. They can be a part of it through their financial giving. They can be a part of it by doing different fundraisers. So I know this summer we're doing a, a challenge called Challenge 42, where we're asking 100 people to sign up and do 42 miles in the month of July. They can walk it, cycle it, run it, run it. it whatever. <laughs> and um, so we've got about 48 people who have signed up so far to say, okay, I'm in, I'll do that this July. And so it's through different things like that, that, that we've been able to do all that we're doing. And where can that information be found if somebody wanted to sign up to it? So it's all on the website, which is onebyone.net. Okay, excellent. Uh, you spoke there earlier about, uh, you know, going low and slow, back to waiting again, and about making decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, you've had to make lots of decisions in your life uh, with, the, you know, the children and the ministries. Uh, this last question I always ask to the guests that come on here, okay? And the question is, of all the decisions you have made in your life, what is the best decision you have ever made? That one's going to be an easy one. It was the day I said yes to Jesus. That is what what changed the course of my life. That is that is why I get the joy of seeing kids around the world be transformed themselves now. Or because one day when I was a nine year old little girl, I said yes to Jesus, and then I never stopped saying yes ever since that point. Excellent. Of course, I could speak to you all night because there's lots of things we could discuss. But uh, if people want to read more, of course, they can get your book. Of course, embrace the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, where can they find that? That's also on the website, onebyone.net. Okay, and again, there's a Mother Bumala. That, that's actually out of stock now, so it's just oh, it? Embrace the Journey, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. You can get the moment <laughs> if people want to buy it. But it's been fantastic speaking to you, Ber uh, Becky. Thank you. Um, a very brave Yorkshire lass going all over the world. <laughs> and as I said, lovely speaking to you. And I'm just going to hand back to Alan and say um, thank you very much for giving us your story. It's a fantastic story. And if anybody wants to do it, Contributing, you can go to your uh, one by one website as well. Okay, thanks Thank again, you. Becky. Thanks, George.
Uh, Becky, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been so interesting listening to you. What an exciting life. It is when you when you give everything to God, when you say yes to God, life is exciting. People think Christianity is dull. It's not. It's the most exciting life anyone can have. But thank you so much. It's been so wonderful having you with us. And we look forward to the day when Matthew is going to share. Maybe uh, sometime in the future, he's going to come and share his story. And maybe you could sign George up for that 42 miles. I think that would be good for him. <laughs> Are you saying I'm fat, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been thank great you. having you with us. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, can I tell you, if you need help, please contact us on our hotline, plus four four seven nine four three double five zero two eight seven. Or go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. Again, there's lots of stuff on there you can, which will help you. You can also f- listen to stories like Becky's uh, from previous Mondays. We've been doing this for over two years. There are lots of wonderful stories that you can listen to and watch. And can I invite you to join us again next Monday, 8 o'clock, for another life story. Next Monday, we're going to Canada. We have Blake Morris from Canada who's going to share his story. He was a miraculous, he miraculously survived at birth. And he said he's witnessed a life of joy and undeserved favor. That's how he put it. He excelled in many areas of life, and especially with the federal government of Canada working in civil engineering. And he's seen many victories, many miracles. Many things that have happened in his life which have been so great. And he's going to share his story next week. So tell your friends to join us on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube next Monday. But thank you again for being with us. And thank you, Becky. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Howard. May God bless you all. May you know his peace, the peace that passes all human understanding. May you know the one whom to know is life eternal, the Lord Jesus Christ. Good night, everyone. God bless you. Bye. Life Stories Live.